What's the most messed up thing that's normal? Story 1. Poor care of beginner pets like goldfish, hamsters, leopard geckos, etc. The fact that one betta fish requires at least a 5 gallon tank is the reason I didn't get one as a pet in college. I'm so glad I researched that because I realized how horribly betas are treated, and people don't care because they're fish. My ex-wife got my son a betta fish in like a half gallon tank. I had to research the crap out of betas and ended up sending him a 6 gallon tank, water heater, gravel, decorations, and food. The dude is 3 years old now and loves sleeping in his barrel. So cool to see my son take such great Great care of his fish. Feeding that fish comes before anything to him. The boys are going out tonight to play ball at the gym. I gotta stop by the house and first feed my fish. I'm tired slash sick and don't want to get up or go to school. Fine, but I'm getting up to feed my fish. Just cool to see a nine-year-old be that caring and responsible. The way people mistreat and abuse animals on the regular only because they're not cats or dogs still boggles my mind. We have research showing that reptiles, rodents, fish, and even insects are smarter than previously assumed and capable of feeling pain and suffering. But yet somehow, a considerable part of humanity doesn't give two craps because it's just a species. The animals get crammed in bare enclosures that are way too small and replaced when they die due to the conditions as if they're just objects that you throw away when you don't need them anymore. They exist just to be mistreated, suffer and die as if their lives don't matter at all. Just awful. Not just pet owners, but the industry as a whole. I worked for PetSmart for about two years in the pet care department. It's not that workers themselves don't care about the animals, but it's the breeders, the shipping conditions, the inadequate in-store conditions, the insane policies that prevented us from providing adequate care, and last but not least, the fact that many stores are run with skeleton crews and pet care employees may be pulled from the department to go cashier or put away go-backs, even if an animal is in need of care in that moment. Is every store like this? No, but the fact that any of them are is reason enough to stop supporting them. Please, please, please do not support large pet stores, at least when purchasing a reptile, bird, rodent, fish, insect, etc. Some people would buy our snakes just to rescue them from our store, and I promise you this does nothing to actually solve the problem. Speaking of just aquatics, it is absolutely horrendous how betas and goldfish are treated, especially how they sell betas, and the little cute bowls they sell for them. A beta needs a minimum of two and a half gallons. Most of the bowls are less than one. My local fish store displays their betas in large tanks. They are probably two and a half gals. The fish are absolutely beautiful from not being stressed in a cup. Sure, they cost more, but they are properly cared for. The only thing I buy at big box pet stores is equipment only because it's cheaper than my local store. Story 2. Zero tolerance in schools. Protects the bully and harms the innocent. Edit. I am so grateful for all of these responses and upvotes. When I made this comment, I was in a bad place after I was the victim of zero tolerance from a company and thought about the kids in my classes over the years who experienced this. And as I have been contemplating leaving a profession I love so much, I just had to write these two sentences and get it out. I thank all of you for your stories and the bravery you have shown to tell them. I have really tried to reply to you, but I am a bit behind because of all the comments. It breaks my heart that kids have to go through this and that adults treat them this way. I wish I could write a book and expose this with all these stories, but obviously this is not possible. I will pray for all of you and keep working at changing this policy, but I am only one person. I urge all of you to speak up if you can. You have been so inspirational and kind. I thank the ones who came to my defense. That was so kind. I don't mind opposing views and therefore I did not make a big deal out of them and I upvoted as many comments as I could. That's tolerance. I accept everyone's opinion and value it. Thanks for making the last 24 hours an inspirational journey that restored my faith in mankind. Bless you. Yeah, my school suspended a kid because a person punched him. The puncher got suspended as well, but the kicker is that he didn't fight back. Oof, happened to me a dozen times from grade 3 through 8. Finally, by grade 8, I just realized I needed to absolutely screw them up because I'm getting in trouble anyway. One was on the very last day of grade 8, and the principal tried to go to my future high school and have me suspended into the first days of grade 9. Didn't work. Luckily, my future principal disliked that lady greatly and said that was cruel. She also once left me behind on a school trip in grade 6. 
She was a piece of garbage who loved every bully like her own. This was all in the 90s and early 2000s. As a parent now, it disgusts me this has somehow stayed the norm. Former teacher here, I quit my last teaching position in part because of an assistant principal who was scarily close to this description. She had a soft spot for any kid who was, let's say, struggling. And while I'm sure this meant she was sympathetic to kids who needed it, this also meant that she was routinely busy protecting bullies from consequences. After one such kid threatened to shoot me and his parents happened to own a gun shop, she refused to take any action and I started looking for a new job. To be honest, I really think with violent actions or threats from students, teachers should just file a police report directly. Don't bother with the administration, just call the cops and let them come directly into the school to take the report and or make an arrest. Watch the admins change their tune immediately. Not a teacher, but it's disgusting with all these videos I see of teachers being assaulted and treated like crap by kids that should be institutionalized and not in a public school. Story 3 having to pay for vision and dental insurance in addition to health insurance. Last time I checked, your eyeballs and teeth were part of your body and should be considered under medical insurance. I'm in the UK and have glasses the NHS doesn't consider medically necessary. They're chromogen colored lenses. I had to pay for a color vision test and then I paid 300 pounds for just the lenses, my frames, and anything extra. Chromogen is FDA approved in America. The opticians I go to have told me before that they have problems with people and kids who need chromogen glasses and just can't afford them. They help with things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, and color blindness. How many dyslexic kids would be better off with chromogen glasses? But the NHS has decided we don't need to read well or see colors. And the fact that dental insurance is capped at like $1,700. That's not even enough to cover a root canal and a crown on a molar. So if you have bad teeth, you're essentially screwed. I've probably spent close to 20k on dental care in my adult life, and most of that time, I've had insurance, as if having to deal with ongoing dental issues isn't painful enough. It's like a one tooth a year plan. It doesn't help with catastrophic issues like normal insurance are meant to do. Bust a bunch of teeth in a car wreck? Yeah, they will still only help fix one. It's not really insurance in the regular meaning of the word. I prefer to call it a dental benefit plan, and the annual maximums have hardly budged since the 90s. Story 4. The amount of plastic we use. It's absolutely insane. And then companies say they are reducing waste, but actually making more plastic to say that they are saving the planet. And then regular people are expected to bear the burden of figuring out what the hell their particular city can and cannot recycle. And then that recycling isn't even always recycled, or it gets shipped over to some other country to deal with. The change needs to happen at the manufacturing slash packaging level for it to make any kind of meaningful difference at this point. The fact that the plastic industry pushed recycling, which is almost worthless ultimately, as a way to mask their responsibility for pollution from the public should have landed people in prison. Same vibe as the carbon footprint, a marketing gimmick designed to shift blame from corporations to individuals and I remember being assigned to calculate my carbon footprint and then giving me tips like take cold showers and take one less round trip flight per year. Meanwhile, I'm lucky to take one trip a year. And then there's the carbon credit situation. I think a lot of people still aren't aware of how net zero carbon works. The thing these companies praise is that they're aiming for. It doesn't mean they won't produce zero carbon. It means that they pay for other people not to produce carbon. Basically like a weird penalty. It's also a big part of why Tesla is ridiculously overpriced as stock. They've been living off of carbon credits for a long time from other manufacturers. Eventually that money runs out. Story 5. South Africa's specific answer, having your electricity switched off for several hours a day. This can range from two to eight hours a day. We just organize our lives around it like it isn't a thing because we've been doing it for 16 years now. It's a long story, but it boils down to our state-owned electricity supplier being mismanaged for decades, resulting in decaying infrastructure. Ongoing corruption is endemic, which in turn results in our country not being able to generate enough electricity to meet the demand. California had this going on for about a year when I was a teen, and our governor was impeached over it. 
They weren't announced in advance often, so crap like being out shopping or at a movie theater when suddenly the power goes out. I can't believe this has been happening for 16 years. South Africa here, feel your comment in my bones, made the jump to move to another country last year for better opportunities. I can't explain how weird it was to suddenly be living in a place that had electricity 24-7. I realized how minute to minute I'd been managing my life every day. Everything from charging your phone, to your laptop, camera batteries, making sure load shedding light bulbs are charged up, etc. I look around at the lives of people who have never had to go without basic services, and it's a strange kind of feeling. Imagine being a Nigerian then. Instead of scheduled blackouts, the electricity just goes off whenever, and you have no idea when it will be back. Depending on where you live, you might get 7 hours of electricity tomorrow or maybe 17, and you can't tell in advance. If you're coming home from work, there's no telling if there's electricity at home. In fact, as a kid, walking home from school and seeing the lights in our neighbors' houses would have us literally running home with joy. Everybody has a personal backup electricity source noisy polluting generator or solar powered batteries if you're really rich, so we are kinda numb to it now, except the poor who make up about 70% of the population, and it's been like this since I was born and I'm almost 30 now. Same in Tanzania, used to be once a week, and now it's 6 days out of 7, I just want to have a night once in a while. Why does the power always seem to zap out when the sun goes down and the mosquitoes come out? Story 6 Side hustles to get by. If you're working full time, you should be able to get by. First, we had work and paying for things. Then Henry Ford comes out with the 9 to 5 and you either do that or you don't have things. Then the Rothschilds, or I don't know, all the elites, have made it so we can either be happy to work or leave. We should be so grateful to work. Every second should be working because work is fun. Monetize your waking hours even with family. It's not about the money when most people should be so fortunate to have a job. I just want to know what the next one will be. A blue check mark or you don't get universal basic income and police protection under social capitalism. You're not socially relevant so you will be appointed a robocop. Provide proof of citizenship and immediately clock in from a verified profile. You will be billed for this conversation. In Germany, you can only work 40 hours a week, though 48 in certain circumstances. This is tracked across all jobs. There is very little under the table work, as it's illegal. Over a six month period of time, your average hours must round to 40. So that's a no go on hustling and making money by working a lot of hours. A typical full time job is 37 hours. Here's the kicker if you have a retail or service industry job, guess what? Minimum wage is only about $12.75 an hour, and there aren't cities like LA, Seattle, or NYC where the local wage boosts it to $18 or whatever. It's $13 in Berlin. Americans rail in the US, but much of Europe is a pretty crappy place to be if you don't have a good job. Story 7 Phone use while behind the wheel. Every trip out is a death roulette game. I see someone nearly drifting into my lane all the time. This is my biggest pet peeve. I'd say a solid 80% of drivers on the road are what I call non-drivers. These non-drivers don't understand that driving is a full-body experience. You constantly need to be looking forward, behind, to the sides, and assessing what's going on around you while driving. You feel input from the steering wheel regardless the tires and traction you currently have. Non-drivers think you just get in and go and give zero thought about driving way too slow or too fast or being in someone's blind spot, not merging properly, tailgating, etc. The list goes on and on, and all that crappy driving can happen without a cell phone involved. Add a cell phone and it's exactly like Russian roulette, like you said. More people need to actually realize that driving is super dangerous and requires your full attention for the duration of the drive. I did it a couple of times as a stupid teenager, though only to change a song, not that it's an excuse at all. That ended one morning when I switched a song and looked away from the road for a second. It absolutely felt like I was driving straight slash just fine, but when I looked up, I was almost entirely on the oncoming lane. I was so lucky that there was no one else on the road then, but it shook me to my core, rightfully so. So for me, it was a good lesson that fortunately ended well, never have done that since still feel extreme guilt and shame over it. This is something I don't understand, and I've always dreamt of posting here in a sub such as No Stupid Questions. Why aren't people cited, fined, arrested non-stop every day until the menace is over? Police have speed traps, why not phone traps? 
There isn't a second of a drive or bike ride where I don't see a driver not using a cell phone while driving a vehicle. I live near a long, one mile long bridge, and when walking or cycling across it to get home, most of the drivers are on their cell phones while driving. Often I watch people's eyes as I cross on the protected sidewalk, and 60% of the time their head slash eyes are down in their lap. Every town, every city, every officer. If a mobile device is in a driver's hand, treat it as reckless driving. Two points on the license and a massive fine. I agree with you 1000%, and I hate to say it, but I think a big issue is proof. Speed traps you have the radar to prove that the speeder was speeding. Phone use becomes a headache quickly, as you know every driver will deny it. I wasn't on my phone. This cop is out to get me. I was just setting my GPS, etc. It sucks, and I would love for every single person on their phone to get exactly that. Points and a massive fine. Driving is treated way too casually, and anyone who points out how dangerous vehicles are is overreacting. Story 8. Zero expectations of privacy. We're all expected to behave like we could be recorded at any time and we wonder why everyone has anxiety now. I found eight photos of myself online in odd sitting positions with people making fun of me in the comments. Nobody asked permission. I'm autistic, so my movements are a bit weird. I hate it. That anxiety isn't due to mass surveillance, it is due to the breakdowns of social connections that started pre-80s. The APA released a longitudinal study on this in 2000 that showed kids today, late 90s, have the same anxiety as asylum kids from the 50s. It's a scary read. Many millennials, I am one but don't get this feeling, get anxious when the device used to post these rings. When we literally grew up answering a ringing phone on the wall with no caller ID. I am this way with the phone. It rings and I panic. Might be more so due to the likelihood it's regarding a bill not yet paid, so I suppose it makes sense. Opposes all around for this millennial. But honestly, how often do you get a call from an unknown number that winds up being something pleasant? I feel like in the 90s slash 2000s, a phone call used to mean a possible conversation with a friend or family member. Maybe an invitation to something. Nowadays, 99% of phone calls I get are from people not in my contacts that are either scams, bill collectors, or political ads. Story 9. Expecting people to be contactable 24-7 and acting like someone is rude if they don't respond relatively promptly. Back when the main form of contact was called, it was deemed relatively normal for people to not answer as they were busy or not at home. Therefore, it was so much easier to switch off and enjoy other things. Now it's expected that people are pretty much connected to everyone all the time, and if you try to disconnect from that a bit, it can almost get you socially ostracized. You can relate it to workplaces as well, and the rise of employers basically expecting workers to be contactable 24-7. Here in Australia, the government wants to bring in right to disconnect laws as they have in France, where employers can't expect workers to be on call outside of work hours unless they pay overtime. The opposition has promised to overturn any such laws if they win government. Sigh. This. I always thought how rude it was to be carrying a device in your pocket that basically has you on call to anyone with the numbers whims. I'm known as the guy who never answers his phone. No crap. It's the most rude expectation ever that I should always answer the phone. Yes, I am in my 40s and regularly shamed by extended family and close friends for 1. Never answering my phone, 2. Failing to call back immediately after a missed call, 3. Not reaching out by text messages or via other messaging at a pace which to me feels non-stop. I am a mom of two busy little kids. I have a full-time job. I have a partner with whom I spend real-life, face-to-face, meaningful time. It seems weird that people would expect me to want to or be able to connect to them all the time. Time. If I speak up and say something about how it makes me feel overwhelmed to be in constant contact all the time and that I need to switch off and enjoy my work and my life, it's taken personally by people who are outside of my nuclear family. For a long time I felt guilty about it and I tried to get better, but over time I realized that it's not like I owe anyone that level of access to my interior life except the people I live in my home with. Story 10 Parents post their children's entire lives on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok and treat them as accessories instead of people. Imagine the horror stories we'll probably hear from these kid influencers in 10 to 20 years time. I mean, not even just kid influencers. 
I'm so glad my whole childhood wasn't posted up on social media or something. It feels like something that could be used against you eventually. The posts that do my head in, mothers posting about how their kids have autism, cognitive issues, learning disabilities, etc. It feels like kids aren't getting a chance to ever expect privacy as adults, or to be able to have their own secrets. This is one of the reasons why I'm glad I closed my Facebook account. A neighbor loved to post about her youngest daughter and I got an incredibly weird feeling knowing so much about a kid I hardly knew. Her ADHD, the bullies at school and on the bus, problems with a specific teacher, times they took her to the emergency room, etc. It started to feel like the mom just wanted attention and her own medical issues weren't garnering enough Enough likes, so she decided to whore out her kids' problems to make up the difference. My cousin has a mom and dad and kids influencer account. It's so weird. Half of her followers are bot, and the other half are real pedos. She posts her kids in such small outfits, and sometimes the angles are just so ugh. I had to unfollow. I've questioned my own family about this, though I don't know how to bring it up with her. She thinks she's cool, you know, and I think it would make a fight. I just have always felt gross about this. Hence, I unfollowed her. Wow. I read a sickening article in the New York Times about kid influencers. Insta moms posting their very young, some as young as five, daughters in tight-fitting, revealing clothing on Instagram, which is of course going to attract creeps. The parents were usually fully aware of this and just refused to stop posting it, even when their kids were getting bullied or they were receiving threatening messages and blackmail from pedos demanding more revealing pictures of 10-year-olds. Utterly horrific stuff and I haven't even mentioned the comment sections. It's just child exploitation plain and simple. It's 100% child abuse in my opinion. Lots of these kids grow up to be activists fighting for laws to protect kids from their own parents posting them on the internet. People need to stop consuming content like this, instead of being like, oh, cute kid doing something funny, and giving it likes and attention. Story 11. Working 40 plus hours a week to make enough money to still be in poverty. I'm not in poverty, but I've had a salaried job where I work 60 plus hours a week for the last 8 years, and I still have to live in the attic of a bar. I don't have kids, I don't have medical expenses, but I will not be able to own a home until I'm in my mid-40s. I thought if I worked hard I would be able to get a house and have a yard. I can't even get a dog, cause I'd feel bad having it trapped in a tiny apartment all day. It's gotten to the point where I'm just looking for a wife, not because I'm in love, but just because we'd have two salaries. Honestly, just working 40 hours a week. This is a super hot take that I've got, meaning not founded in science, but I think if we built a society that is based on the fact that we're animals with language but still animals, humanity and the world would be better off. Like people know that if you keep pets in suboptimal enclosures, the animals will get depressed, anxious, etc. Or if you have dogs that are high energy, working dogs, they need to be worked. But humans are just all expected to be some kind of weirdo automata and be okay despite everything showing us everything kind of sucks how it is. My father once very smugly told me there are 168 hours in a week, and working 40 hours drops that to 128 hours. 8 hours of sleep works out to 56 hours, leaving 72 hours I could use for other jobs if money was tight. That doesn't take so much into account, but that, or something very similar, is commonly repeated. The average commute is around 1 hour each day, so you've lost another 5. Then you've got to shower, brush your teeth, go to the toilet, probably adds up to 30 minutes a day, so 3.5 hours. Then you've got to prepare food and eat, say an hour a day total, another 7 hours. Grocery shopping, one hour a week. Housework, cleaning, tidying, washing, washing dishes, etc. On average, that is one hour per day, so seven more hours. Other things like sorting bills, fixing problems, doctors, dentists, car service, family in the hospital, etc. say one hour a week on average. Then one hour a day for arriving early, slash staying late, slash having lunch, etc. So five hours. That's 72 hours down to 42 and a half hours, but that's fairly streamlined. The WHO says 150 to 300 minutes of cardio per week to be healthy, and also muscle strengthening activities at least two times per week. So take roughly the middle of cardio and one hour per session for strength training. 
that's 5.5 hours. Add in getting to a gym, stretching, showering, etc., and that's probably 7 hours. If you have healthy sleep patterns, it takes on average 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep, so that's 2 hours. Let's also say you don't rush through absolutely everything in life. Add 30 minutes a day, so 3.5 hours. Now we're down to 30 hours. But that's no rest, no hobbies, no socializing, no spending time with a partner, no looking after kids or other family, not actually enjoying life. Three hours a day to actually live and enjoy yourself takes it down to nine hours. Add an hour's commute per shift and you'll get one shift, maybe, if you can find a job, if you can find a job that will accept only one shift per week. Zero time to enjoy yourself would allow three shifts. But what's the point if you can't do anything with the money? But I think the bigger point is, if you are spending half of your waking life working, you should be able to live comfortably without requiring a second job. I simplified it for the sake of brevity, but yeah, he did break it down a bit more to account for things like commuting and eating. By and large, all the time should be spent getting the bare amount of sleep needed to get through my next work shifts, with minimal time allocated to food, plus commuting and all other time should be 100% dedicated to work. The Eight hours of off time basically was six spent sleeping, one for eating slash chores slash showering, one for commuting, and in his view an hour was generous for the last two, and I could save a ton of time with jobs in town that were no more than 20 minutes away. At one point, he mapped out how I could work two full-time jobs or one full-time job plus two part-time jobs if I intelligently used my time. But of course, laziness meant I expected to be handed everything and he never had a single thin dime handed to him. Story 12. The amount of sugar we consume and give our kids. I finally found a can of peaches that didn't have added sugar or sweeteners in it. It cost me $6.50. What the hell is wrong with us? People really don't understand how expensive it is to eat healthy food. Fresh meat, dairy, and produce cost more than processed food that is loaded with sugar and salt and crap. And there are whole swaths of the US where fresh food is many miles away. This is not true. So tired of it being repeated. It does not cost more for a bag of potatoes than it does for a bag of chips or fries. It costs less to buy rice, beans, chicken, and vegetables, and a few different sauces than any comparable source of prepackaged calories. It is not an issue of cost. It's more of a gap in being taught how to cook from scratch, and the fact that people's tastes are warped by exposure to foods that are chemically enhanced for flavor, smell, and mouth feel. I'm kind of convinced kids that grew up in the 90s and 2000s probably had the highest sugar intake of any kid. When you look back at all the things we drank and ate, like it was pretty normal to just mostly drink fizzy drinks, sugary juices, squash, and so forth. And practically everything we ate outside of healthy meals was just pure sugar, cereal, snacks, etc. Sunny D was literally banned in the UK at one point for how it was basically just orange flavored sugar in liquid form. Like I remember getting hyper from that stuff and it used to be marketed as a healthy drink. Oh my god. I used to pour a bowl of cereal, then straight up dump straight sugar into the bowl. There would be a gooey sludge of sugar on the bottom of the bowl when I was done. How am I even still alive? Story 13. Filming strangers without their knowledge or consent and posting it online for millions to see. In 2004, when I started my filmmaking classes, I did some B-roll of a crowd outside of a metro station. My teacher told me that you can't film people without their consent or knowledge. You either need to put a disclaimer somewhere or film their back or feet. I felt very bad about it. Somehow, this is the new normal now. I was at Ikea the other day and someone was just filming around and I'm pretty sure my face was in there. It's upsetting. This is an American thing. Illegal in Europe without consent. Here come the comments that go, but they are in public space. Yes, on a street where 10 people can see me scratching my balls. Not on the internet where millions can. I ended up in a viral TikTok for months because I was in an area minding my business where the dude was filming in a very busy and central shopping center in Melbourne because of something unrelated to any of the people in the video. I remember thinking at the time, is he filming? But I was in a rush, so I didn't think much of it. Started getting messages from friends all over. I'm talking even about Europe and the UK. It made me so uncomfortable. I don't use TikTok at all, and to have myself there so 
front and center was horrendous. Luckily, it did not go viral, but apparently when I was at the grocery, someone filmed me in the produce section talking to a guy and laughing. I don't know the guy I was talking to. I'm pretty sure it was just some passing comment on how many carrots I was buying because it was a lot. But the person who filmed it put some filter on it and had some sad song and some text about how hard it was to see your one true love with their true love or something like that. But I don't know the guy who filmed it either, and there was a weird zoom in on my face. I only found out because someone who knows me knows slash follows the guy who made it and was confused. But there was the potential for this whole fake narrative to get out there when it was totally divorced from reality. So not only can people film you, which is scary enough, they can edit it to seem however they want. Story 14 trying to guilt the consumer into thinking that they are the ones who can really make a difference with recycling when 98% of all waste is industrial, retail, and restaurant, and none of them are big on recycling if they do it at all. The figure is from science writer Elizabeth Reut's book Garbage Land. They do this in my state with water usage. You can get fined for watering your lawn too much, and there is a huge push for residents to cut water usage. Well, residential water usage is only 6% of all water used in the state. 90% is used for commercial and farming purposes. A push to save water there could save more water than all residents use combined, but it's on us for whatever reason. It's all to grow alfalfa in a desert, a lot of which is exported. All the feels. In California, residential use is 10% of human water use, and we're shipping alfalfa overseas as well particularly to Asia, where the alfalfa is fed to cows and sold back to us in the US. If AG water in my state, I'm in California, wasn't significantly subsidized, we wouldn't be effectively exporting water from a state that's famous for its recent droughts. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you'd like to share with us, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time.